I'm from the future. I came here in a time machine that you invented. Now I need your help to get back to the year 1985. Time travel has always been fascinating because uh, it's something that I think we all fantasize a little bit about and that makes it really interesting. And you know when I started studying film I realized that telling a time travel story in a movie lends itself to doing it probably better than in any other medium. Bob Zemeckis and I for years had discussed the idea of doing a time travel movie and we were never able to figure out sort of the hook, what was going to make a good subject for a time travel movie. Well, after we made a movie called Used Cars, I was back in St. Louis visiting my parents and my father went to the same high school that I went to. And I found his high school yearbook in the basement. And I'm thumbing through it, and I find out that my father had been the president of his graduating class. I didn't know this. And I'm looking at him and thinking about the president of my graduating class, who was a guy I'd have nothing to do with. And I thought, would I have been friends with him if I had gone to high school, or would I have just hated his guts? So when I got back to California, I'm telling the story to Bob, and he's going, yeah, that's really interesting. So we just got going with that, and that was the germ of the idea. Well, used cars didn't do too well at the box office, but Columbia Pictures loved it. So the head of Columbia, Frank Price, said to us, as soon as you guys have another idea for a movie, bring it to me first, I want to hear about it. And by, I don't know, September of 1980, maybe October, we said, okay, let's go, let's go tell Frank Price about this. So we set up a meeting, we go in to Frank and we tell him, basically, this kid goes back in time and goes to high school with his parents and his mother falls in love with him instead of his dad. Within days, we had a deal to write two drafts of Back to the Future, Columbia Pictures. All writing is hard, but our working relationship is truly collaborative. You know, we really check our egos at the door and we debate everything and we do it understanding that it isn't just, you know, to win, it's to make the movie good, and so we don't have a problem with that. We use the index card method of, of, of plotting. So we had a big bulletin board in our office, and we would say, okay, we know, for example, Marty goes back in time. So an index card goes up, says Marty goes back in time, and then towards the end, Marty goes back to the future. That's another card. So we said, okay, wouldn't it be cool if he invented rock and roll? So we put up a card saying, Marty invents rock and roll. Well, we need to establish that he can play rock and roll and that he wants to play rock and roll. So that means that somewhere on the bulletin board before the card that says he goes back in time, establish Marty's desire and ability to play rock and roll. Same thing with the skateboard. If he's gonna invent the skateboard, show him on the skateboard. So these pairs of index cards would come up. But to write a screenplay like Back to the Future, it was just an immense amount of very hard, back-breaking work. I mean, there was nothing really fun about writing the screenplay. It was really hard. We had a first draft probably in five months. They asked us to make changes. We spent another six weeks or so, had another draft in spring 81. And basically, they said, well, you know what? It's a really nice, sweet story. But we're kind of looking for raunchier comedies these days. No thanks, we're gonna pass on this. So we said, okay, let's go take this around. And we were getting the same exact message from everybody. This is just not for us. But among the people that we showed it to was Steven Spielberg. They brought it over to me and they said, uh, nobody gets this, maybe we're crazy. Will you, will you read this and let us know what you think? And I read it and it was a very unusual story. And yet it was based on a lot of old fashioned principles of, of family, coming of age, getting your first car, all the dreams and desires you have for your own life, the dreams and desires your parents might have had but didn't succeed in realizing. And um, it, it was about the generation gap and it was about the major disconnect between our generation and our own parents' generation 
And that was all done through an amazing object lesson, which was this uh, sort of accidental trip back into the past. He said, oh, this is terrific. I'd love to be on board and help you guys get this made. But Bob and I were in a position where we'd done three pictures with Stephen. I want to hold your hand and use cars, which Stephen executive produced in 1941, which we wrote for Stephen. And none of these movies were big hits at the box office. So we were getting a little superstitious, thinking, well, if we do another movie with Steven and it bombs, we'll never get another job because we'll just be those two guys that only work because their pal Steven uh, helps them set up their project. So we were totally candid with Steven and told him that this is why we didn't want to attach him to it, and he understood completely. So we're taking it to producers, we're taking it to studios, everybody's saying, take it to Disney, take it to Disney. So finally, Bob and I said, well, let's go take it to Disney. So we set up a meeting, and we go in, meet with an executive, and we sit down, and he says, are you guys insane? You've got this scene with the kid and his mom in the car. This is incest. We can't do this. So it was too extreme for Disney. Well, I think it was a tough sell at the time because Bob Gale and I had no success credentials. So... Bob Zemeckis said, look, I got to direct again. I got to direct something. And I'm going to direct the next decent script that comes along. That was Romancing the Stone. And that was a very successful movie. So suddenly studio executives thought Back to the Future might be a good movie. So it had actually nothing to do with the material. And Bob is saying, well, let's go back to the one guy who always believed in it. Let's go back to Steven. We had this good friend in Steven who's a filmmaker. And a filmmaker can see the work of a director and read a screenplay and kind of imagine what that movie might look like. So he always understood what the movie was. And we said, Stephen, you still interested in doing Back to the Future? He says, damn right I am. And so we set it up. It was the first Amblin project at Universal uh, set up with Stephen not directing. I guess they call you Cal. No, actually, people call me Marty. Obviously, the most important character is Marty McFly, and every young actor in Hollywood wanted to play him. And we did an exhaustive search and read a lot of people and, and just trying to find the right person. I was shooting uh, Teen Wolf, and um, we were in Pasadena, and we were shooting, and I had all the stuff on my face, all the wolf drag, rubber and hair, and I'm feeling miserable, and I can't eat. and. To make matters worse, just down the road, there was, there was a scouting crew there for another film. And we found out that it was for this new Spielberg-produced film called Back to the Future. And I heard that, that Crispin Glover was in it. And I knew Crispin from uh, other things, and I'd worked with him before. And I thought, man, Crispin Glover's in this Steven Spielberg movie. And I'm like, Teen Wolf. All of us seized upon Michael Fox right from the beginning, but he wasn't available. He was doing a very successful television show at the time called Family Ties that had been created by Gary Goldberg. They wanted to offer me Back to the Future before I even did Teen Wolf. But uh, they had spoken to Gary, and Gary couldn't release me from my contract. And Gary kind of had figured out that there was no way I could do both. So we begged and tried to see if we could cast Michael, and we couldn't. And then we started really looking for somebody who might embody m many of the qualities that Michael had. But we were given a mandate that we had to e make the movie by a certain date. And uh, if we didn't make the movie by a certain date, they would cancel the movie. So being a, a young and a uh, hungry filmmaker and maybe uh, having a bit of an inflated ego, I thought, well, I can make this work. So, you know, as you do when you're making a movie, you may finally make a decision. And that first decision was to go with Eric Stoltz. We shot for five weeks with Eric. He was totally professional but there was just something missing. He's a magnificent actor, but his comedy sensibilities were very different than what I had written with Bob. And he and I just never were able to make that work. And he showed me the first five weeks of footage cut together, and he just said, I don't think we're getting the laughs that I was hoping we would, we, we would get. And, and I looked at Bob and I realized that he was absolutely correct. And I said, Bob, what do you want to do? So I had to make this horrific decision, which was very heartbreaking for everybody. But luckily, um, I was able to um, convince the studio to let me reshoot five weeks of work. 
So we went back to Gary Goldberg, and we were on our knees begging, we need Michael, we really need him. And Gary said, okay, look, I'll tell you what, I'm going to let Michael read the script. And if Michael wants to do it with the understanding that family ties always comes first, if you guys are willing to make that accommodation to us uh, and shoot around our schedule, then I will let Michael read the script and we'll see what happens. So at Christmas time, I was called into Gary Goldberg's office and Gary uh, gave me an envelope, a manila envelope with the script in it. And he said, here's the script, take it home and read it if you want to do it and you know, do you have my blessing? Like, and I went like this, put it down on his desk and said, I love it. It's the best thing I ever read. And, um, and that was it. And we literally set up this plan where we had a station wagon with a bed in the back. And Michael would finish his tapings on the TV show. Then he'd get into the station wagon and he'd drive out to the set for night shooting. I'll probably work until about 4.35 in the morning. And then I'll sleep until about uh, 6 o'clock. From the moment that I said that I would do it, it just kind of, I was caught up in this, this cyclone of of activity and creativity of the highest level, just really brilliant people, brilliant filmmakers, brilliant artisans. I mean, it was just, it was just so much stuff. And, and then at the same time, then there was a practical matter of shooting it, which was uh, I'd work at family times from 10 to, to about 5, and then go over to the set, and I'd get there probably about 6 and start shooting, and work all night till about 4 or 5 in the morning, and then go back and get, literally get driven home and carried in the house and dropped in bed, and woke up in the morning, and, in the shower and I mean it, it was just crazy. Somehow thanks to Michael Fox we made it work and he turned out to be the perfect Marty McFly. He's a reactive character he was written that way he reacts to everything I mean because he's a stranger in a strange land so he's basically the alien in the movie and it takes an actor with a perfect sense of comedy timing and a really great actor because it's been said that acting is reacting. So he was able to understand that the the humor was not in the punchline, it was in the reaction. And he can sleep in my room. I gotta go. Uh, I gotta go. Thanks very much. It was one. I never tried to tackle any of the physics of it, or the temporal logic or the space-time continuum or any of that stuff. But from Marty's point of view, I understood the story. I mean, I understood what his, what was driving him. I mean, it was basically, you know, girls rock and roll and, and skateboarding. I mean, it was, it was not far from being the major focuses of my life just a couple of years earlier. And two of them still were. Kids, we're going to have to eat this cake by ourselves. Your Uncle Joey didn't make parole again. Our approach was, all right, let's find young people who are, you know, 18 to 25 who have really good acting chops, and we will get them to act old with makeup and so forth and we read again every actor of that age and Leah came in Parker? and just blew us away well I just think it's terrible girls calling boys Marty it's just terrible I got involved with Back to the Future I believe because I was doing a movie called Wild the Wildlife with Eric Stoltz at Universal and um, apparently Zemeckis and Spielberg were looking at Eric Stoltz, and uh, they said, who's that girl? That's the story I heard. And so they called me into audition, and for some reason it just clicked for me. When I was your age, I never chased a boy or called a boy or sat in a parked car with a boy. When we were shooting the first scene where you see Lorraine and as the older mom, and, you know, it was a really difficult scene because we had to hit the comedy, but we had to show just how sad she was just how bad her life had become. And it was then that I realized that I was gonna spend the rest of my life with him. <laughs> and that's one of the interesting things about comedy and one of the interesting things about working with Bob Zemeckis is that you have to kind of weave, you know, you have to know your, the, the, the reason you're there in that scene and you have to hit the jokes and then hit the, the depth. Luckily, Bob was there to like tell you what points to hit with, with a lot of precision. You know, he demands a lot of precision. And so I loved working with him for that reason. Now, now Biff, now, I never noticed that uh, the car had any blind spot before when I would drive it. Hi, son. Crispin had this unusual way of talking and these strange mannerisms. And he was George McFly, there was no question. I loved Crispin and I loved working with him before I did Back to the Future. 
he did some episodes of Family Ties, and, and I did a TV movie with him. And um, people think about the way he acts, the way he talks, and all that stuff, but it's in his head. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, he sees things differently and thinks about things differently. Like one point when I chase him across the street and onto his porch step and tell him he's got to take her to the dance, he, he had this broom. And he wanted to give us, he wanted to give a sweep with the broom, like this elaborate kind of sweep. And Bob was saying, what's with the broom? And he said, oh, it's a sweep of indignation. And, and we said, okay, well, that's cool. I mean, I, I was fine with it, but, but uh, you know, you just, you just, after a while, you didn't try to figure it out. And again, it gave me more reactive. Hey, what the hell is this? Breakfast. Wendy Jo Sperber was my daughter, and, um, but she just was really funny. She just was totally hilarious and so comfortable. And because she knew Bob Zemeckis and Bob Gale, you know, I was jealous of her because she just like knew them and like could joke around with them. And I was still a little bit in awe of them. With Wendy, uh, we met on I Want to Hold Your Hand. And we became brother and sister like right away for the rest of our lives from that moment. And then Bob hired us for used cars. And then we got hired for uh, back to the Future, and we always kept saying, like, how lucky we were, you know, first of all, to have met Bob Z and Bob Gale. You realize what would happen if I hand in my homework and your handwriting? I'd get kicked out of school. Uh, you wouldn't want that to happen, would you? Everybody has a bully in their school. Would you? Well, now, now, the no. interesting thing is that Tom Wilson is absolutely the total opposite of Biff. He's the most gentle, good-natured, uh, decent guy you could ever meet. But he had this persona that he put on that was intimidating, and he plays it so straight, that's why it's funny. So why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? Yo, Jennifer. Marty, don't go this way. Strickland's looking for you. If you get caught, it'll be four tardies in a row. I had auditioned for Young Sherlock Holmes, Gremlins, and Goonies. They were all done by Amblin, and it got down to me and one or two other girls for each role. So when they called me in for Back to the Future, it was all the same producers, and I was like, hey, it's me again. And then when I got the part, they talked to ABC, because I had just done a pilot for ABC called Off the Rack, and they wanted to make sure that the pilot wasn't getting picked up, because they were going to film at the same time. And ABC said, we love the pilot, but it's not going to get picked up. You can cast her. They cast me. And then ABC changed their mind and picked up the pilot. And so I had to back out of Back to the Future and, and turn it down. So they had to recast my part. I did six episodes of my series. But when they let go of Eric, they recast me. Party slip for you, Miss Parker. And one for you, McFly. I believe that makes four in a row. In 1984, I was doing the uh, David Mamet play, Glenn, Gary Glenn Ross on Broadway. And uh, we had run about a year. And then I got a call from uh, Robert Zemeckis to do this little movie, Back to the Future. And uh, I understand that it was because of my performance in Prince of the City that they thought of me for this character. No McFly ever amounted to anything in the history of Hill Valley. <laughs> Welcome to my latest experiment. This is a big one, the one I've been waiting for all my life. I was doing a film in Mexico City, and I got a call from my agent saying that he was sending a script, which, of course, is Back to the Future. And the script arrived, and I just had no interest in it. And I put it aside, and I just, that was that. I was going back to New Haven and do a play you know, where real actors belong and all that stuff. And a friend said, never leave a stone unturned as far as the business goes. You never know, you know. So I read it, and I thought about it. I thought, well, the least I can do is go back and meet Bob Zemeckis. And he was very engaging. He exuded confidence and intelligence, and just a certain rapport I felt immediately with him. And I felt, I'm in good hands here. This is something that if, if this man is involved with this project, is something I should do. And as I do with any character, you know, I read it, I begin to think about what did this guy look like? What are his characteristics? And almost right away, Einstein was a no-brainer. And my other thought, there was a renowned conductor by the name of Leopold Stokowski. I remember I presented these thoughts to Bob Zemeckis, and he didn't even, he just like, okay. This is it. 
This is the answer. There's no jokes. We tell everybody, Bob tells, you're playing this completely seriously. And you watch Chris Lloyd's performance, he's taking it totally seriously. He believes everything that he's doing. But you never knew what Chris was going to do until the camera rolled. And Chris would do something on take one and take two that he, never, he would never do in rehearsal. But just so that we could understand what Chris was about to do, we would roll the camera during rehearsal because unless the camera was rolling, Chris wouldn't really give you anything close to 100% of his performance. And because of the energy he had and the focus he had, I could see why he couldn't do that for five takes of rehearsal for the sake of the lighting guys and the camera guys. But it worked out fine because, you know, Chris, once he found what he wanted to do, was very consistent and would keep doing it over and over again. I suppose Jane Wyman is a first lady. Whoa, wait, Doc! And Jack Benny is secretary of the treasury. Oh. I felt there was a need for a certain zaniness. I mean, Doc was sort of constantly in crisis. He had this excitement, and that kind of drove the physical life uh, in whatever way it went. I didn't, I didn't think too much about it. I just went with that, the energy that came out of that kind of uh, crisis mode. Are you telling me that you built a time machine? DeLorean. It was an important character in the movie. Obviously, it's the device that sends our hero on his adventure. So there wasn't like a lot of serious thought going into should the car have a grand entrance. It was just always assumed in my mind that it would. One of the things that pleased me was to see the car for the first time. I made sure that all of the details were brought out. We would cross-light the various functioning parts and so forth. It wasn't as if they just took a car and said, OK, inside this car somewhere is the time machine. It had been very thoughtfully designed. They took the trouble to make the car um, a, a uh, sort of an offshoot of Doc Brown's character. In the early drafts, it was not the time machine was a ch time chamber. It was not a DeLorean. In the draft I read, it was a refrigerator. And I didn't have a problem with it, but Zemeckis and Gale weren't satisfied with it. And they were doing their old pacing back and forth. Bob was behind the typewriter, and Zemeckis was pacing and pacing and trying to figure it out. And they couldn't figure it out. And I kind of got bored and left. And Bob said, you know what? Wouldn't it make more sense for this to be mobile? Next thing I knew, a week later, they gave me some re re revised pages. And they had turned the time machine into a DeLorean. Looks like an airplane. Well, I win. As far as designing the car, you know, we just wanted it to look like it was something that could actually look like a time machine and also something that looked like it was built in someone's garage. And the third thing was it had to look kind of cool. That car, its lines are very clean. It's not a sculptural form. It's a very simple, almost uh, boxy kind of shape. And I think that it made a good kind of a canvas to put all that crazy stuff on top of. We received three of them in October of 1984 and brought them to my shop. We had some lovely drawings from Ron Cobb and Andy Probert was very, very big on it. And the drawings, they weren't made with the idea that here are these specific parts we want to put in these specific places. It was about the feel of the thing. So it was like a scavenger hunt to go to surplus stores, electronics shops, all these places where you can find used things, bring the used things to a workshop, and start putting them on the car. And then our crew built it and made all the parts work and made sure everything made sense and was properly attached for all the rigors of the filmmaking that went with it. And Bill Klinger I hired to do all the electronics. We had a team of about three or four guys that had nothing but putting in all the electronics. We started with three DeLoreans for the very reason one was going to be our hero car. It was going to have a full complement of all the electronics, all the design elements, all those pieces that told parts of the story. The second car was going to be used exclusively for driving shots and stunt work. And don't worry, we'll never see it up close. Action! 
Then, in addition, we had the C car, what we call A, B, and C car. The C car we used for the process work. And we just literally kept sawing it in half like a sausage as the camera moved forward to right over Michael's shoulder when the scarecrow in the field comes up on the windshield. It wasn't outside, it was actually done on a stage. And so that was the process car, and that had very little in it. I gotta tell you, I hated that car. I really hated it. You had that friggin' sharp metal box that, you know, if I went like that, I'd just jam my knuckles, and I just ripped my hand up. And, and also, it limited the gears, so it would, it would only be low gears, and I'd be revving high at low gears, and thinking that it was gonna crap out. Then came the next conversation, which is, what exactly is time travel gonna look like? When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. And we met with ILM and talked to them, and they said, well, here's some ideas. And that was one where Bob and I quickly came to the conclusion, you know what, it's not about the visual effects. It's not about how long does it take him to travel through time. He's traveling through time, it should be instantaneous. So there is no time travel sequence as you see in other time travel movies. It's like that. But one of the various ideas that ILM came up with was a fire thing, and we worked with Kevin on that. There was something interesting on a sort of a primal level about that, and it just constantly got refined and worked on, and we knew the idea that we had this neon on there, the neon ought to glow and do something, and ILM came up with some image where uh, bolts were shooting out and it was sort of like opening up a hole in the space-time continuum and the DeLorean was gonna go through that. So that's sort of what you're seeing during time travel. That's how it happened.